So we're just waiting for the message from Tom to tell us that everybody is in the room. It's always very weird to be uh, welcoming everybody in, but we can't see you. <laughs> Shit. Turn my emails off. So we'll just let everybody come in and settle, and then we'll just wait for Q before we start. Everyone can get everyone can get comfortable. So just waiting for a thumbs up from. Uh, that was a thumbs up, Steve. Just waiting for a thumbs up from Tom before we crack on properly. He's just checking that everybody that's registered is get is in. I've had a, I just had a text off someone telling me to cut my hair, so I was giving him a video. <laughs> we could do a live hair cutting as part of the... You know, we've got about an hour and a half, Steve. We could get it done in 90 minutes. Quite an interesting way of doing it, wasn't it? So... Uh, yeah, we're getting lots of messages. Well, there's some people popping in the chat already. Yeah, if you want to, you know, as we just, before we start, if you want to come in the chat and say hello, say hello. Um, that's always nice to hear. Some names I recognize already. David and Zach. Oh, hello, Zach. <laughs> Early question, what are the set times? We're just getting ready. This is a, there's no support today. It's straight into the co-headliners. Are you co-headliners or are we going to have a top billing? I think co -headliners. I think, let's appreciate it, Steve. <laughs> okay, so Tom, are we ready to go? I'm just waiting for a message from Tom. It's looking good. Thanks everyone for saying hello. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning for the third of these promoter masterclasses that we've been running they're really nice because they've been nice and slow and steady um something that tom from atom presents down in worthing has uh, set up and created during covid as something positive to come out of this time so thank you to tom and atom promotions uh, who have been putting all of this together and created and curated these ideas um and they've been terrific so far and this morning won't be any different um, so I'm John Austin. I'm uh, the chair of uh, the Association of Independent Promoters, a new organization that helps support, uh, does what it says on the tin, supports independent promoters in the UK. Um, so we know we've got some AIP members here this morning. Um, and I'm going to just be sort of leading this conversation. Uh, most of the talking is going to be done by the two guests this morning. So we're going to introduce them in no particular order. I hadn't even thought about an order. We'll start with Dan. I'm going to introduce Dan Monsell first of all. Dan was actually um, one of the founding members of AIP. Indeed. We met, we met around a table somewhere <laughs> and um, he's one of the people who've helped bring that organisation together. Dan runs, well he'll tell you what he does, but he runs uh, Rock Feedback, uh, which is now called part of a thing called Form. Um, and, uh, and he has a relationship um, creatively and business-wise with our other guest this morning, Steve Tilly. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. And Steve will tell you a bit about himself, but is now, uh, a, a, you know, he is a promoter at Kilimanjaro um, and um, promotes all different kinds of acts of all shapes and sizes um, and has a relationship with Dan. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about there this morning, the, the, the sort of what we do on these masterclasses is we explore a little bit about the journey of our guests because it's always very interesting to see um, how and why they became or remain a promoter. Um, but we're really here to like look at the ins and outs of promoting. So we're particularly interested in the things that they have learned upon the way, the things that they have learned to do, the things they've learned not to do, key moments. Um, but also the reason that we've got these two people here to, today, and I will make, I'll be very clear, like we're very aware that this is an all male panel this morning. It's a manal is the name, but we're conscious of that because, because Dan and Steve do have a business relationship that we want to explore just a little bit because part of their journey is they're both individual promoters who've gone on their own journey, but now they have a working relationship. And that will be quite interesting for some of the people out there to explore what it's like to move from being a very independent promoter to part of a larger group 
what that might, might, how that might change how you work or not, what the benefits are. So we're going to explore that a little bit further on. So we, um, just to be clear, it's not we've picked just all men to be here this morning. Um, and we're going to talk about the return to live. That was the theme and talk about audience confidence and audiences as part of the theme through this morning. And that happens to be very timely, perhaps because of the news this week. Um, so, and Tom is going to run some polls through it. Um, so you can see one's up there now. So um, you can vote on that and there'll be a few polls popping up and we can see the results. So he's asking a question about uh, just to see who's in the room this morning. So it's always quite interesting. Normally, most of the people in the room are people who are promoting or want to promote or interested in that part of the sector. Um, hey, look, and the results are in already. Mm. We've got some established concert promoters, some people who work elsewhere in the music sector, some people who are thinking about being promoters. So we're particularly interested in you people. We want you to come and get involved. Um, okay, so we'll crack on and we're gonna be here. And, and questions, you can fire your questions into the chat as we go. Um, and we'll pick up on those either through it or towards um, later on in the conversation. So let's just start with you both. Whoever wants to lead can lead. We just want a little bit about, keep it short, about, you know, your journey into promoting. Like what has brought you, what brought you into promoting? Who wants to start? Who's looking more keen? <laughs> it's a little, oh, so it looks like I'm getting the nod here and you told me to keep it brief, which is, you know, <laughs> um, it's, it's hard. To, I mean, maybe I'll just, I'll sort of, I'll sort of go for it and how far back to go, but maybe you can, you can feel free to jump in and tell me to, to hone it in, to rein it in, perhaps. Um, and it's also good to see who's here. Obviously, we've got people who work in the industry by the sounds of it. So, and obviously, a lot of people who, or some people who are looking to maybe work with some promoters. So, um, you know, just in terms of what we're talking about, that can maybe take a bit of a a, um, a movement through as, as we kind of work out what's what's interesting to people today, I suppose. Um, I guess I will start about where I'm from in terms of um, what may, may become a promoter in the first place. And that, I grew up in a town called Exeter in Devon, uh, in the southwest of England. Um, and uh, I guess, believe it or not, for some people, um, it had a very good music scene when I when I was when I was growing up around you know becoming a teenager and things. I see someone there from Devon, <laughs> and um, uh, you know, despite so it always had the sort of the folk acts and the, the drum and bass acts that were in the sort of fringe stages of Glastonbury but but when I was there it just sort of kicked out Muse who had come from Exeter at that point and um Chris Martin and uh, and uh Tom York had been at university there and, and sort of started being a band at that sort of time as well and and he I think I'm not sure I'm sure the exact story but he helped put on shows a bit but mostly the venue that was important to me was a place called The Cavern um and I was a musician first and foremost um, and I would spend sort of all the time at the cavern, either trying to get on support bills or playing there. Um, and I think the important thing for me there is that that venue and uh, promoters called Dave Goodchild, who ran it alongside some other great promoters in, in the city, as some of which are still active now, um, they sort of showed me that a promoter would kind of help create a scene ultimately. And that, um, you know, when Dave Goodchild put on Fugazi in Exeter, which he did, um, you know, the, the day after rehearsal rooms in Exeter were sort of full of bands trying to sound like Fugazi and yeah. um, and and sort of you know create to create a scene as it were and I think that was had quite an impact on me what it could do kind of for that community. So I then went to university in London and I think I was looking for a similar type of community straight away. So I, I went to UCL in, in London and, and did got involved with everything I could and started to run the music magazine, the, do the radio, and I was a promoter at the student union, um, for UC union. And in fact, actually, when I say it like that, I was probably quite annoying, personally tried to do everything by the sounds of it. <laughs> so I was doing that and uh, really just trying to get involved everywhere I could in, in music in London. Um, I guess, like I said, sort of probably searching for a bit of a musical community like I'd had basically in Exeter. Uh, and the promoting thing was the thing that, that was most interesting, really. I was, in, I was doing these shows in the union starting to book the kind of rising bands that were kind of getting buzzing as I was seeing it. Um, and at the same time, kind of going out and about in London and seeing kind of what was happening industry-wise um, and and kind of getting involved in that side of things as well. And through that, I um, also started writing for some websites, one of which was at the time rockfeedback.com, which was one of the first uh, sort of online music magazines run by um, 
Toby, who still uh, is, is acting roughly about today and ran transgressive records as well. So through that, he was also running a, um, a monthly night called the Basement Club at the Buffalo Bar, uh, which was, um, oh, yeah, yeah. Some, people, some people may remember it fondly. It was uh, below High Breeze Station. Station. And um, they, you know, we'd have like the, would be like Metronomy, Rock Party and Regina Spectre and Maccabees and Libertines, all their sort of first gigs. And I became the DJ at that night um, through, through friendship with everyone there. Um, and at the same time, uh, I had decided to take the union nights I was doing uh, in the UCL union, because it was actually not a very nice room, if I'm honest. It was a kind of, you know, little sort of student union vibe and bands would turn up and not be massively impressed by it. Um, so I, I started at the time, of the Barfly group had the fly down the road on New Oxford Street. And I um, decided to sort of spin out and do my own nights there. And uh, didn't seem to have any issue about using my own cash rather than than the student union cash. I don't know why it didn't phase me. Maybe at the time it was quite small fees and quite quite small ticket prices. Um, although I did notice the first three or three or four times when I was my you know my student loan was, was diminishing quite quickly. <laughs> um, so um, from there, I, I um, yeah I basically spent the summer interning at labels like Domino and things like that. And when I finished university, I I come very close with Toby and Tim, who were contemporaries of mine, these two enthusiastic chaps who were running transgressive and running rock feedback um, and sort of hung out there for the summer after university until I guess happenstance helped that they, they'd got they got some investment to basically create a wider music company and I was to be one of their first hires which they offered me a job to um, not just uh, be, be a label and a, and a promoter sort of beginning club night it was also to work with some brands and music and also do some tv work and music so I was going to come on and run the nights for uh, club nights book some of the, 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 um, the TV stuff we were doing, book stuff for brands. Um, and we moved to above the Lexington, which was at the time not a venue. It was a, I think it was a, it was a crackdown actually before we then came in and <laughs> turned it into an office. Stacey who runs the Lexington now ran the Buffalo Bar and that was kind of how it, how it uh, came right, out. Okay. And we helped kind of get that venue started a little bit by putting all our, our nights in there and booking bowls and, you know, get, getting the thing going. Um, and I started to decide I didn't want to just do one club night every now and then. I wanted to book a lot of shows and sort of got the bug for that more and more before um, we did some bigger shows for the fifth anniversary of Transgressors with the label with, with Foles at Heaven and Graham Coxon at Union Chapel and Johnny Flynn. And I started to think, hold on, maybe I could, should be this thing called, I didn't really understand. I was like, maybe it's not just putting bands in rooms, it's you know, the relationship with the band and helping build. You know, I was just doing gigs for in the Lexington for first aid kit or Heim or, um, and then suddenly all these people were there and I was not really understanding you could have a relationship with brands. So I, I sort of got that. <laughs> and at the same time, I've been doing this work with brands as well. So I, I decided doing projects for Xbox and um, Spotify and, and The Guardian where I was booking some quite big talent, sort of people like um, Ellie Goulding and Maccabees or Mark Ronson for Spotify or Ed Sheeran for The Guardian, in fact, and Ford and, um, and agents started to take me a bit more seriously because obviously there was some more budget than my small budgets for the Lexington at that point. <laughs> um, and from there, I obviously started to sort of work in little pockets of, I guess, pockets of music that I found that artists were wanting to develop with me. You know, at the time, it was, there was something called, people called it chill wave, an awful term, if you think back, back to it, <laughs> with bands like Tori Moir and uh, Neil Indian and Chromatics, and, and who I still work with now, and who are great, or the folk bands I was doing, like, um, like Johnny Flynn and and coming on to people, to people like Father John Misty and um, artists that I grew from, from their first shows and, and, and just started to get bigger and bigger, really. Um, you know, some of the American indie bands that, again, I still work with, like Waxahachie like and Kevin Morby and um, Soccer Mummy and bands like that have just kind of blurred into when it was then and now. And I started to become a promoter, basically, from there. So, uh, and then we started doing some festivals. We did... Uh, just just interrupt. Festival. I think it's quite funny that you've gone that far into the <laughs> journey and then said, and then I started to become a promoter. But... <laughs> You've actually been promoting for quite a long time. But that's quite funny that, that there's something in that, that there was a moment where you perhaps haven't taken yourself yeah. seriously. I think not. Yeah. I think not. And that was it, really. So I, th I, thought, I thought I'd go, I thought that was interesting because I just, what is, why, why we came in promoting this, what it was. I can stop there, actually. I think that's no, it's, I think we'll come, we'll come, yeah, no, I, I just thought it as a person, it was a reflection that you've had all of these really interesting different things happen. You've been putting your own, you've gone from spending other people's money to your money, you're, but you're quite far down the line when you go and then I became a promoter it's like I, 
I don't know if Steve yeah. was listening, it, I would have seen it happen a lot earlier. But Steve, you've got some similarities. I mean, so your your Dan's coming up from the south. You've come down from the north, right? Yeah. In the north. And your journey, yeah. you've got some similarities in terms of dabbling, right? You dabbled in this, uh, you dabbled in that. I mean, to be honest with you, I could just go basically apply what everything that Dan just said to me, and it's the same. That would be a very short version of it. Really? I'll try a very quick summary. Um First video I ever remember watching as a kid was Another Brick in the Wall by Pink Floyd. And I loved it. Like, amazing song. First live, first album I ever bought was U2 Under a Blood Red Sky on vinyl. And it's still to this day the greatest live album ever made, I, I believe. Probably overdubbed to Helen Bath. Anyway, let's not go there. Um, first concert I went to was Queen at, at, at the NEC on the Works Tour. And I was 14 and it blew my mind. And every single thing I've done, I think, has led to where I am now, but I never had a plan. Um, so I left, <clears throat> left the Northeast at 18, and I screamed at my parents. I didn't give a shit which university I got into. I was leaving home. Um, so I got in at North Staffs Poly in Stoke because I only got a C and a D at A level. Um, and I needed to get two Bs to get into Brighton, Sussex Uni, and I didn't even get my two Bs. Stoke Uni, I answered an advert for in the student union window to be a humper. A humper? Uh, a humper. Not a very PC phrase these days. But, um, you don't see that in costumes yeah, these days. You don't see that in the show costumes often, do you? That? Yeah, yeah. So for, for, 15 or, for 10 or £15 a shift, I got into the gig for free. I helped the band load the gear in. I hung around, got a pass, which I, as, a, as an 18 year old kid, I proudly wore my pass right there. <laughs> Like you do when you're really proud of having a pass to get into the gig. Uh, and then um, worked on the student union gigs, uh, became a student union DJ, um, became a, became assistant social secretary, became president of the students' union uh, once I'd graduated. Um, then I did decided I wanted to be a journalist. I went to Preston, did a one-year journalism degree, uh, post-grad, came back to Stoke, uh, got straight onto the Evening Sentinel as a journalist. All through this time, I'm DJing. All through this time, I'm a musician. musician. All through this time, I'm obsessed with music, um, listening to it or going to watch bands and also playing in a band. My ambition was I'm going to be a pop star. I'm going to travel the world. I'm going to get... I mean, I'm going to get paid to play. <laughs> you know... What, what's wrong with that? I'm going to get paid to play and travel the world. That's like, that seems, I'm going to avoid a proper job, basically. So um, <clears throat> anyway, journalism was not for me. Lasted about four or five years. My band didn't get anywhere. Made lots of mistakes as a musician, as a band person. Got to my mid, mid to late 20s. Not going to be a pop star. Um, <clears throat> I'm the DJ. I'm now a quite well-established local DJ in Stoke. Got two or three nights a week. And then Dave Corbett, who was the promoter at the stage, which is now called the Sugar Mill, he got a job at DF Concerts in Scotland. And so he left Stoke. And I said, who's going to put all the bands on? And I was his main contact on the local paper. So I wrote about all these gigs that he put on. All oh, right, okay. All the bands on. He went, don't know, why don't you have a go? I was like, well, I don't know what to do. I booked one gig at the Students' Union. I booked one gig when our social sec was off sick. So um, basically, Dave, I took Dave out for a pizza. He showed me a costing. He gave me a list of agents' names and numbers. And for the next two years, while he was in Glasgow, he was on the end of the phone. What do I do about this? <laughs> this person's a bit of a tosser, isn't he? How do I deal with that person? I would just say this, say that. Okay, nice one. And so basically schooled me in how you do it. All through this time, I'm now managing couple of local bands i've opened a rehearsal studio i've opened a recording studio i'm me and my old business partner and uh, god rest his soul were um basically determined to put stoke on the map musically and we were determined to turn a city with a poor image uh, reputation nationally into a more vibrant place so we got and our ambition was to manage artists and get a band signed and go on and conquer the world promoting was never my ambition it was something I did because I can make a bit of money, can can stimulate the whole scene, blah, blah, blah. So I thought promoting was a mugs game, which a lot of you might have. 
um, I still often say I should have mug written on my forehead because if you analyze some of the business conditions we have to operate in and the deals that we have to sign up for, if you're on Dragon's Den, they piss themselves laughing at you. What do you do that for? That's ridiculous. You work for what, Margin? But they wouldn't understand the complicated ecosystem of the music industry overall and where we fit in. So, and of course, we do we do have an amazing amount of fun doing what we do as well. Um, but I, I won't ramble on about that. What I'll say is managing um, was going okay. I got a band signed to a major label. I was going to quit promoting. But the guy that owns the sugar mill took me and Ant out for a coffee and said, I don't want to lose you guys. I know that unless I sell you a share in the business, um, you're going you're gonna to be gone. Um, so do you want to buy half the sugar mill off me? And we were like, you could have knocked me over with a feather that day. Um, and then that's what happened. We turned the, the club into a really, it's the centre of the Stoke music scene. Mm. Agent Blue was signed to Island Records. And um, that did my credibility in agent land and a whole world of good. Because all of a sudden, I wasn't just a guy from Stoke. I was managing a band signed to Island Records. So certain agents like Steve Strange rang me for once about something, do you know what I mean? And he was being really nice to me. And other national promoters, who I won't name, who I couldn't... I used to... They used to pick the phone up to me and go, what? And I'm managing a band with a single week in Kerrang! And I've got them ringing me, kissing my arse. It was so funny. It was a very salient lesson in the way this world works. But... Um, the band didn't work out. Sugar Mills took off. Um, I've managed to start bringing bigger and bigger bands to Stoke, doing bigger and bigger venues. And by 2008, about, actually by 2007, I decided there's a glass ceiling in Stoke and I've got my face pressed firmly against it. And I just thought, you know what? I've got a, I love Stoke and I go back there when I'm allowed about once a month um, at least. And um, I wouldn't be where I am today without Stoke or the Sugar Mill. Uh, but I needed to get out and I needed to reach out and I needed to see what else I could achieve in life. So in 2008, got offered a job by Stuart Galbraith at Kilimanjaro. And here we are 13 years later. And don't ask me how it all happened. I, I, you know, to, to get to do what I've done with um, the artist that I work with, the biggest one, is not something I'd ever have dreamt possible. And all I'd say to anyone watching this is you can achieve whatever you want. You just got to work as hard as you can, make your own luck and hope the wind blows in your direction oh no that's really great that's really and that's quite a good place to leave that because that's actually i think i'm i met when i first met steve i remember was in uh, the uh, backstage area of reading festival and he'd been at Killy for three or four months and uh, mark walker introduced us and said here's the new boy and here he was um so we'll come back to that because so it's very interesting that um that both of you've got very there's lots of similarities right We're trying this trying that you're both musicians, uh, you're both right, and you, you're all dabbling in all these different things, and there's no career path. There's just like, you know, Dan's very interesting. Dan is part of a music community in Exeter and then wants to find that again. And, and Steve, you're driven by music and want to create a music um, scene in a place that you're very passionate about, and you've achieved that. Like the Sugar Mill is the heart, you know, Stoke is... Um, is on the touring circuit right now. It's an established part of that. So as um, on those parts of your journeys coming through, the promoting aspects, it was very interesting. Steve, you had a you had a mentor really, right? Is it Dave? Yeah. Dave, yeah. So you had, Dave that, you had that. Dan, what did you have in terms of like things like, yeah, putting on shows, costings, marketing, working out what to pay a band or not pay a band. How did you fumble your way through that? Was there anyone that helped you or did you, what, how did you do it? It, it? it was a fumble, I won't lie to you. I think that that was the one thing about going straight, you know, just doing it ourselves. And I think that, you know, it's, we'll come to you later, but that's kind of why it's nice to sort of now talk to people more like when I talk to Steve, particularly people who obviously are more experienced than I've been in, than I'm in because we really did do a lot of it and get people saying back, agents going, why have you done this in the costings? Like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and then you kind of have to learn the hard way in a, in a strange way. Um, and I think that, you know, that's to my point about not really understanding what it was, what being a promoter really was at the first place with that. It was kind of, you know, in a way it sort of worked in our favor in a way, because obviously there was a record label associated with us. We were doing this other stuff as well, whether it was TV stuff or otherwise, that we could come at it a bit, a bit sort of innocently. 
um, and kind of not really disrupt things maybe as much as, as otherwise people are like, oh, these guys and you know, these, these guys do different things. They, they can kind of be involved as well now. And I think that was maybe to our, um, like our sort of, we didn't, it wasn't calculated as like it could have been, but we kind of naively managed to sort of find a space in some things for ourselves through doing that. Um, occasionally, yeah, occasionally finding, uh, whether it was just a, a friendly agent here or there, which we did have help us or, um, you know, especially if, if there was another relationship with them, maybe on a management front or whatever at that time we could call upon or another promote, you know, even early on, I think I co promoted a few bands with Steve and probably looked at Steve's cost costing sheet and went, oh, I better change my costing sheet. <laughs> <laughs> this looks a bit better. My like five items on a, you know, on a, on a dodgy XL is not going to really cut it for when I do slightly bigger gigs. It really, we did, you know, I think well, we, you, did, you did when you see other people do stuff or it definitely came about through that a bit of a kind of a learning curve, steep one at times. So yeah, I would say that's probably how, how it worked out. And for, for both of you, for either of you, uh, as you were going into the promoter, as you were promoting, were there things that um, came, you, you noticed came easy to you or you felt that you were naturally good at? And were there things that you, um, were, were bad at or realized were holes or, or were difficult i as a promoter you know it was like on my journey i remember thinking i was very good at getting people in a room but i was very bad at dealing with tour managers and i ended up you know so actually one of the first things I ever did was get a rep the first point that i could i got a rep to handle the tour managers because i was terrible at it did you have those kind of experiences did you notice things that you were coming good and coming bad <laughs> steve smiling <laughs> Well, the problem is <clears throat> my my business partner Ant had been in a band called Venus Beads, signed to Roadrunner, had had more experience than me. He'd been around the country touring. Um, he knew promoters all over the country, like DIY ones. And I said one day, Dave Corbett's leaving Stoke. We were already um, we'd already had our rehearsal studio that we were running, and we had ambitions to build a recording studio. And so I said. We need to put, we should get into putting gigs on. And Ant was just like, oh my God, you don't want to do that. It's a fucking nightmare. Excuse my French. He goes, it's horrible, Steve. You stand on the door and you're literally counting people until you're broken even. Because remember, this is pre-internet. So you didn't have, you, you didn't have um, online box office to start with. We had local shops selling the tickets and we were selling tickets out of an envelope and a uh, Tupperware box down the studio to all the bands. I mean, it was like I did I did a my vitriol gig where when we opened the doors, I'd sold 68 tickets and I needed 168 to break even, and it was about eight quid. So I'm 800 pound down as I open the door, and I'm like, oh, and we're both just depressed. <laughs> that song "Always Your Way." that got played on the radio the week before, which is one, it's still their best song, I think. It's an amazing song. We had 120 pay on the door. And by the end of the night, we were jumping around. And like, being a promoter is a bit like, it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. So the peaks are amazing. The troughs are horrendous. And I think, um, I'm going to use a trendy phrase, flatten that curve. <laughs> <laughs> try, and, try and get it. Try and go along so that you can cope with the can cope with the troughs. You don't get carried away by the peaks. You just try and go along in a straight line and take the rock with the smooth. Um, and I think what to answer the question, what what I think I realised, you have to be a bit of a jack of all trades. You got to be good at everything. We were, I I did the guest list. I've done security. I've done I've done holding the stage barrier back from a moshing bunch of crowd because we haven't put it down on the floor properly. Um, I've made the sandwich. We used to try and avoid doing bands buyouts. We used to make the sandwiches in my house. We used to get some MDF and cover it in tin foil and then, um, <clears throat> and then um, cling film and then taking the back of the car down to the gig. And we used to like, I realised quite quickly that you, it's like you're putting on a party. <clears throat> and if you are party for the punters, but you're also putting on a party for the artists. So, when they arrive, if you just say hello, show them to the dressing room, say there's the kettle, there's the milk, there's the tea, um, there's where you put your stuff, da, 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 da. They were like, oh, my God, we turn up at so many venues and we just get shouted at by a grumpy sound engineer or a grumpy <laughs> bar manager to be met by someone with a smiling face who's into our music who wants to help us get our gear in 
and then makes shows us where the kettle is. Like, literally, before anything's even happened, they know the rest of the day is going to be fine. Then further on down the line, there is a little issue on the night. Something happens at the gig that causes a problem. Because you were there at the beginning, you can just sort it out with them. There's, it's, there's not that kind of combative thing. So I just learned to do all the jobs, basically. I also learned how to be a, a genial host. Um, I also learned how to say no. I, I, I mean, I could tell you some horror stories about some arguments I've had with tour managers. and Because if they turn up with an attitude, in the old days, we were like, they've got an attitude, they're going to get it right back at them. I'm not saying that's professional, but at the time, we had a little bit of me and us versus the world attitude. Mm. But to cut a long story short, you just learn to, to do all of it in the end because um, you have to. Yeah, yeah. I was, yeah very, much, very much the same. I think that, again, I was probably naivety. Like, I didn't really realise that you could do all the different things. I think that was that there, are, there were other people doing other things. I, mean, I thought you just had to do it all yourself at the start. You know, it was amazing that people could come in and run the show for you and, or, you know, go out and get the ride or do the door, you know, but we did it all. And the same thing, I, th I think over time, I realised that maybe through some, again, a number of harrowing experiences, which I'm sure I could detail a lot. And also, you know, I also, yeah, well, I did also, because I also, at the same time, was doing, at a very early point, you know, strangely looking back on it now, I was doing some quite big brand events where we'd like doing street closures for an Xbox thing with Skepta or, um, or I did an event at the top of the BT Tower or, you know, the, um, just, just kind of strangely like high high pressure things that I you know sort of felt scarred by <laughs> quite soon after that I, I, production wasn't really my strength I, I didn't you know production was I probably felt arrogantly that I was better as a curator or better as a creative basically and um, which I probably still feel now which is maybe you know maybe that's a little bit more self-awareness but ultimately having really good production people was was a, a good first learning just being like look people that you know I can go home at the end of the day if the show happens, I'm not going to get a phone call because they're going to sort it out. And that's that is when you're running 200, 300 shows a year. That's just that's the one thing you, you're really, really hopeful for. I think as a promoting entity, because you just know that, or plus, you know, obviously, that you don't have to get phoned up every night. And if you've got those people helping you, and you people you rely on across the board, I think that's um, that's been a big a big learning. As yeah, and that remember. that's part of the transition, isn't it? From the the bits when you're doing well, like Steve was saying, when you you know you're doing the shows where you do everything, you 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 know it's exhausting to be there from the start to the end and all everything in between. But that's that's quite often a promoter's life. But there's a moment when you have, a, you know, for me, I remember the first time I had two shows on the same night, you know, and then suddenly you in a diff slightly you can't be in both places at once, and that kind of journey to the point you're just talking about, Dan, when you're running several hundred shows. And you've got a team and there's this sort of you're moving away from you're not the you you, you have a different role right you have you, you start to move into choosing which bits you're going to come into or come out of in terms of your i, I don't want to focus too much on the harrowing but on the were there any particular pivotal shows somebody's asked a question about like was there a big show for you but i'm interested not you know like We've all got, hopefully got great, you know, we've all got lots of stories about when Dan rattled off loads straight away of all those band, little bands playing that went on to be big. But in terms of your life as a promoter, were there particular moments that were key um, anywhere on your journey, really, that have been like, <clears throat> oh, this is a key moment for me? Uh, from my point of view, um, I started to fantasise about doing the Victoria Hall in Stoke. It was like, I said to Ant, well, imagine if we get to do a Victoria Hall. And he was like, oh, because he was always, I'm glass half full. He was always glass half empty. Right. Bloody agents will tell you anything. They'd sell their mothers to get what they want out of you. He literally filled me with that kind of like, don't trust them. You know, they'll tell you anything thing. And so give me a healthy scepticism to, to what uh, they had to say. One agent rang us up booking a new band and she used the word guaranteed top 10. And Ant took the phone call. And he just literally started laughing down the phone. Guaranteed top 10. Where, <laughs> when was that? You know, and like, and, and so, but they were just, you know, they were, that person was just trying to sell us a gig. And that was the giving it the, giving it the all. So I started saying, I'd love to get into Keele University, which is a thousand tickets. And I'd also like to get into the Victoria Hall. And <clears throat> Aunt was like, oh no, it's a nightmare. We'll lose a fortune. You, How you big know. Victoria Hall about it? How 
it's about 1650 1700 something like okay. that okay um but i did start dreaming about doing the victoria hall and before that we did um we did uh we did the levelers at keel and the guy called luke fitzmorris who was the keel ends manager he he took me under his arm under his wing a little bit and encouraged me to try and use his venue and he did this really good deal and he sort of he agreed to sort of help cash flow it a little bit and he just he was really helpful and positive and so we went and did the levelers there we did 700 people we i think we broke even but seeing 700 people in a room having a good time and knowing you put it on gave me a real thrill and off the back of that i co-promoted the human league with a guy called pod um who's still going is the gig car gig cartel we did the human league at the victoria hall that was my first victoria hall and it was a bit of a nightmare uh, because the tour manager was proper hardcore now at the time i thought he was being a tosser in hindsight we were we were not very professional so he was demanding he was doing his job for his client the artist and making sure that they got what they needed but we were sort of trying to cut corners to make a bit of extra money so i learned from that experience um but the victoria hall show that stands out for me is the one where i realized this is amazing it is it, when I was a kid, I saw loads of heavy metal bands at uh, the City Hall in Newcastle. And so that was my childhood venue. Uh, I saw Iron Maiden, Motley Crue, Bon Jovi, all sorts of bands there. And I had this dream about doing the Victoria Hall because it reminded me of Newcastle City Hall. So Paul Ryan at the agency group had become really, um, uh, really supportive of us and used the sugar mill all the time. And we put Trivium on and we, and we really did a great job looking after Trivium and Basically, they requested they came back to Stoke when they broke and we put them on at, um, the Victoria Hall and we sold it out. And I remember being there that night, looking around the room, thinking somewhere in here, there's 16 year old Steve watching Trivium falling in love with music. And I'm the guy that's putting it on. And that, to me, is still one of the most significant gigs I ever did. Brilliant. This is what it's like. This is proper. This is big. <laughs> brilliant oh that's yeah that's that's really love and now with the bon jovi motley crew reference i understand that the lockdown hair going on. <laughs> dan what, what about you were there any particular moments for you uh, uh, yeah there's, there's a few i mean i think I, I sort of mentioned it earlier the first sort of bigger gig i did was we did this this series for the it was, i guess 10 years ago for the fifth anniversary of transgressive where we we did foals at heaven i remember wrecking the venue about three like three times i was like i'm gonna just you know like so how do you do this sort of thing and working it all out um, and then we did Graham Coxon at, um, at Union Chapel. And it's quite funny because he just released a folk record, Graham Coxon. Graham well. Coxon. He's going to do a, a, you know, a folk show. And um, we all know the Union Chapel is a, a quiet space, but he turned up and just rocked out, like did his rock set. And I remember Peter, a lovely man who ran the Union Chapel, came over to me and just was fuming the whole way through <laughs> <laughs> that we put on this, you know, put Graham, I mean, like, it's Graham Coxon. He does what he wants to do. So, yeah, so that, that was probably the first bigger ones. But then... My first Ali Pali was, was with Flume. I sort of skipped Brixton and went straight to Ali Pali, which was quite odd for a promoter in London. So that was quite a, a moment. And then I guess more recently... Um, how was that? Let's just go... I mean, how was that? That's a big jump, right? It's a big yeah. jump. Ten, what, 10,000 tickets? How, 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 how does that feel for a promoter for the first time? Felt, felt good. It felt, obviously it was felt sort of oddly... I mean, you don't... You, don't, you realise there's less that you do day to day. You can sort of... You've got a lot of good people by this point, and obviously, I mean, Steve okay. knows much more about this than me. But there's much, there's less on the day than uh, than, than other gigs in a strange way. And, um, Are and you that's... nervous though about the money? Are you nervous about the audience, or well, is that, it at that point? Sold... <laughs> yeah, this was sold out luckily, so you could turn up knowing that was fine. But um, it is... okay, but, yeah, yeah. I've... I don't know. I think I think you know by that point, there's a confidence, I suppose, that you have to be prepared for the step ups each time otherwise you don't really you know then that's that's the business isn't it really i think that luckily there's always been the ambition to do those sort of shows size shows so it was it's and i had done enough of big shows by that point so it wasn't as much of an issue but yes it's it's a, it was a good a good on the day feeling and a good you know good, like good team around it that were all very sort of supportive of each other which was nice but as i just say more recently i helped open the venue earth and um, programmed it for the first couple of years there and, and sort of being around the renovation and then it opened its doors after 40 years of being derelict. And we had Mulatto Stardesque, like a, a, you know, Ethiopian jazz musician play, 80 year old man play the first show ever there. And it was, that was a, just felt like being involved in a new kind of phase project was also a real special one as well. Oh, on the way, you've talked quite a lot about um, 
the learning you know there's been some really interesting things about the learning curve and the relationships with people um and like, it's like steve was saying you know there's a, sometimes it's an us versus the world and then actually you go oh actually maybe we're the ones who are unprofessional and all of this thing so in terms of like as you're progressing and building relationships or well are you building relationships how important are relationships um and i mean for promoters a lot of the questions coming in a lot of, you know the key uh, quite often a key relationship is agents right are agents the key relationship for you how's that journey been from booking your local bands to dealing with agents um yeah just just uh, have you got a you know are they the are they the most key in your life or is it do you have a sort of is it managers is it the artists is it the venues is it your teams uh, it's a difficult question because i think it depends what level of promoting you're doing um <clears throat> but um if you i i as i referred to earlier and, and a lot of people work at kilimanjaro I'll take the piss out of me for always going on about i used to be a journalist but when i was a journalist i used to try and get interviews with robbie williams for the sentinel because he was our local pop star hero I couldn't get an interview with him for love nor money they just the label stonewalled me all the time <laughs> I used to deal with a guy called David Joseph, who was the RCA press officer, wow. uh, and for on Robbie, so and take that. So um, uh, obviously he's now the top guy at Universal, and he's the chairman of the Brits. So he's very very up there. And I was I was at the 1975 show at Heaven. Um, they were just starting to break, and David Joseph was at the back of the room, and I went over and went, "All right, David, remember me." And he sort of looked at me because he did it. And I went, Steve Tilly, I used to work with you. I'm the promoter of the show tonight. And I used to work with you back in the day when you were in the RCA press office. And he literally went, oh, my God, Steve Tilly, Stoke Sentinel, is this your show? I was like, yeah. He goes, oh, my God. And then so the, the what I'm trying to say is your contacts, no matter who they are, they're everything. They're absolutely everything to you. And, and you should treat everyone the way you would like to be treated. It's how you should treat other people. And I come across people now where I am who have who have been involved with me in some way pretty much from from the age of 18 onwards. Be it Dave Corbett, who was the Keel Entz manager when I first met him, who's now high up Live Nation DF concerts. Steve Hoyland runs Academy Music Group, uh, all the venues. He was the Keel University Entz manager. Um, Steve Homer, who's the MD of AEG Live, was Keele University Ents manager before Dave Corbett. Um, loads of different press officers and music based people who I dealt with as a journalist are still in the game. They're at record labels, they're, they're, they're managers. People I knew when I was managing Agent Blue in the early 2000s, they're all now, some of them are managers, some of them are A&R people at other companies. Some of the A&Rs that chased me for my band when I was a manager are now managers of acts that I promote. So Seagirls manager John Chapman was an A&R at Radiate. Um, you know, Dave Bianchi, who's a big manager now, was sort of more of an up-and-coming manager in the early 2000s. And he had, um, oh, what were they called? Boy versus Boy, I think. I can't remember the name of the band now. They didn't make it. I remember but, them. I remember them. Uh, <laughs> they came and played the Sugar Mill because we looked after them. So we did a favour gig, one of those 50-quid favour gigs that – is a real burn of contention for local promoters. That argument about, I put you on 50 quid, why do I not get a return show at least once? Well, we put them on twice when no one gave a shit, and I got to know the band really well, and they made sure they came back. And they came back not just because the agent wanted to be loyal to me and my investment, came back because we did a really good job looking after them, putting them in front of people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, you just, you bit, you've got to work your relationships and so, and all of those relationships feed into you getting more business. And yes, the agent is a key part of that because the agent decides where that's going to play. And your relationship with the agent is really important. Um, but it's not just about that. It's about how good a job you do overall because Johnny Burrell, who was much maligned as the singer of Razorlight, um, the story goes that when they turned up at the Sugar Mill to do a sold out show when they'd just broken, there was a queue down the road to get in and that's when johnny realized razor light was happening so it was a significant moment for that band to go we are we are happening we've turned to the stoke there's a queue down the road this is really happening guys these things are starting to take off and on the next tour chris myhill who was the agent at the time rang me up and went 
I've just finished the Razor Light Tour. It's all, it's, we've got the whole thing done, but Johnny specifically wants to start it in Stoke because that's when he realised they were happening. So we ended up plugging in Akil Uni at the start as the first night of the tour. And I've still got the poster at home and it says, this is another one of my proudest moments. The poster said, An SGM, Metropolis, PVC and Tremolo presents presentation. Yeah. So I got my name on the national tour ad and we were called Tremolo at the time. That was our presenting brand. Um, and that, you could say that the agent made the phone call and gave me the show. It was the artist who wanted to make sure Stoke was on the tour. Yeah, and you're quite right. Everybody goes, a lot of people in the music sector, they start what we find in these conversations. They're all passionate about music. And quite often they've, they haven't followed one career trajectory. They've, they've moved from journalist to musician to whatever. So you're quite right. You find these people that was a PR and now a manager. They, they haven't left their passion. Their passion for music quite often doesn't pay, not always. And you rock into them again and again. Um, and so the people that you do meet and like, you know, you're probably going to meet and like them further down the line. It is, a, it is quite surprising. So oh, can I tell I, you? I, I, oh, go, go for it, Steve. Sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry, Dan. I'll, I won't dominate this. It's just it's sort of quite funny. My first, my first or second ever show was a, was a gig uh, where Stuart Camp was the label product manager and had to do a ticket buy. So he had to buy 10 or 11 or 12 tickets for a Stoke gig. And I remember dealing with Stuart Camp that day and selling him his tickets. And I'll joke with him, Stuart Camp, for anyone not uh, aware, manages Ed Sheeran. And I have joked with Stuart going, just imagine if I'd been a dickhead. <laughs> and tickets. Like if, you know, just yeah. imagine. Because people do have very long memories about the way, who yeah. they come across, who they deal with, how they're dealt with. And it's a bit like that film Sliding Doors. You could just, something could happen. It just means oh, I'm not working with him. He's a prick. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because Sliding Doors reference as well um, in there. So, so I'm, uh, I will just, I'd echo everything that Steve says. And ultimately I'm very aware that the person emailing me pitching a band who I've never heard of before, or, you know, met that is very likely to be, you know, effectively my boss one day and, and or, you know, have something that I would love to work with them on that I've, you know, that. And I think that I've, that's been the, I felt that the whole way through. And I think as much as I can hopefully keep that sort of at front and center and, you know, treat people with the respect that they deserve and their own enthusiasm, I think that's always been the case. So I think that ultimately, yes, my network of people I've worked with across the years has sort of has been consistent and, I, and there's obviously always new people, but ultimately it's quite the range of it from agents to managers to artists and otherwise um, are all, are all, being, are all being key really across the board yeah and do you um Connell Dodds when we talked to him he put people on a bus he put people so people on a bus were you know were people that they were on the bus and they weren't getting off the bus i.e wasn't going to work with them and and his his philosophy was so his message wasn't like be nice to everyone it was like if people aren't being nice to you or whatever he, he chose he wants to work with the people he gets on with and he's yeah. happy to not work with the people that he doesn't. I think, so, yeah. Is that a good it's... philosophy or do you work slightly differently? Do you have to bite I've your tongue found, a bit? I've, I've found, I have found that maybe the more I've been in the industry, the maybe the less patient I've been with <laughs> certain people. <laughs> However, um, there is, it is show business. I think if you have to remember this at the end of the day, it's, it's, there's an element of this that is very uh, up and down that people kind of, you know, that you have to grit your teeth to go to people with people at things at certain times that you don't wish to. I think that we have to be realistic about that, that at the end of the day. It's, I mean, you know, you see it more brazenly and often the American show business model than perhaps we still have it in our British live music ecosystem. It's just done in maybe a slightly more polite manner. But um, yes, I think I, I, you, know, you try and have as uh, short to memory in that respect as you can. <laughs> As I said, if someone was a dick and we got them an off day and then suddenly something comes 10 years later, I, I guess I should try and keep an open mind, but we've all got a secret bus, haven't we? Let's not lie. Let's not lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve, so we left your journey as you were, you know, you were a pretty independent promoter and then you take a job at Kilimanjaro. So could we just talk about that? So for some of the people that he, listening in, some people's journey straight into work at the big promoting company or, or an organisation and some people are an independent promoter forever and some of them do this journey that you're doing. So 
Um, yeah, what was the change like to go from sort of spending your own money, your own risk, being perhaps having your own choices maybe, to coming into a you know an emerging, growing national promoter? Kilim Manjaro was quite new at that point, but still you know, is one of the biggest in the UK. How was it for you? What were the changes like? Um, as, as all the good sides and whatever the bad you can talk about in terms of your cha changes for you as an individual and coming to London, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I got to the point where if Stoke-on-Trent was a country, I was Simon Moran. <laughs> you didn't come to Stoke and it wasn't my gig. I, I had a little bit of competition with Matt Bates, obviously, because he was a Stoke promoter as well. Of course. Um, who, you know, I, but I, as far as I was concerned, I ran Stoke, the music, <laughs> right? And that makes you sound like a gangster, but I don't mean I don't mean it to. But so, but a lot of my friends were people like John Dunn were starting to climb the ladder as promoters. I'd seen some other people I knew in the game. A few agents started saying, you know what, you could be doing this nationally. You should be doing it. You could you should take on the city. But there were some really key agents that really encouraged me. Ian Huffham from X Ray. Um, who who can be a quite dry, um, to the point kind of guy, but actually he's fiercely, fiercely supportive of independent promoters. No offense. I did I did a Graham Coxon show with him where he came up to the sugar mill for it, and like I just I I think I used to joke with John Dunn, who's who's, who's uh, one of my closest friends in the sort of live space, and I used I used to hang out with him at South by Southwest every year when I was I used to go over there just as a Stoke promoter. It was a bit of a jolly. I paid for it out of my own money. Just wanted to go, and so. Um, but when I joined Kilimanjaro, I joked with John. I went, "I'm really sorry, John, but for the last three or four years, I have been literally. I'm like a sponge. I have been soaking it all up, listening to the way you spoke to managers, listening to the way you spoke to labels, listening to the way that the national promoter approached things, uh, as opposed to a local promoter. With the greatest respect to anyone listening on here." Your world, you're in your own little world and you worry about your show on your day and, and all the issues arise around that one show and then you move on to the next one. Whereas when you're an astronaut or an agent and a, and a manager, obviously you're dealing with a career. And the most frustrating thing as a local promoter is knowing that you might be lucky to get one more go around on that artist. And the brilliant thing about being part of the artist team as a national promoter is as long as you play your cards right, and you don't, uh, obviously, you do, we do lose artists, I'm, I'm afraid. I've lost a big act that I worked with from day one. And it's really painful when it happens. But um, basically, you become part of their team. So like the radio plugger, like the PR person, uh, like the record producer and the engineer and all that, you become part of their team and you help them grow their career. And if you're lucky, you go on a journey with them where your first show is the Barfly uh, and your last show is the O2, or your, or your most recent show is the O2, and you've done all the shows in between. Um, that's the journey you can go on as a national, and it's unfortunately not a journey you can go on if you're a, a promoter in one at one venue in one city. So um, I think I might have gone off topic a little bit. But... No, 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 no. It's good. That's the that's the that's the tran that's the transition that you were yeah going going through, right? And were there any sort of like practical changes were there things like i don't know like a band you really wanted to work with but you had a boss that said no you're not steve or a band you didn't want to work with and your boss was like steve you got to do it or how was it for you creatively with it or, or was it just here you go get on with it to be honest with you Stuart took on me and alan day on the same day we've both been running our respective cities and the most brilliant thing about Stuart is he just facilitates you to do what you're good at he doesn't micromanage. He, he's got a great eye for detail. Great. He, we talk about any deal at all that's going to involve uh, a degree of risk, obviously financially. But the reason he he takes on promoters he trusts because we've we've done it with our own money, and so we aren't going to we're not going to waste his money either. Nothing's changed mentally in my head at all. It's still my own money, as far as I'm saying. I'd have an argument over the case, the price of a case of water. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that doesn't change. Uh, and sometimes you have to work on things because of relationships. You know, if you've got a really good relationship with an agent and a manager, then they might take on a new act and just ring you up and say, just sign this act, going to send you some music. Can you see if you can find some shows? I mean, in the comfort of my own home, I could put, put the music on and go, gosh, this is a bit of shit. <laughs> but you might decide, well, 
these people are people who really like me and I really like them and I trust their ears and I trust their judgment and they want me to do it. So you've got to be pragmatic. Um, to be fair, I don't think there's any act I work with where actually that is the case. Um, but, you know, you could, you might go, oh, I'm not, really, I'm not really feeling this. But then two months later, you see him in a packed room somewhere at the Great Escape or whatever, and you're like, ah, oh, okay, the singer's a superstar. All right, I get this. Because you've got to buy into it sometimes, and sometimes you're not going to buy into it just because you heard one track on mm. Spotify. Yeah. Yeah. To answer Fanny's question, I look at Spotify stats by taking with a pinch of salt. Absolutely. And for you, so you're an in the, you know, you, you, there's a team and you're working alongside other people doing things, but you're, you know, you're at Ali Pali, you're doing the, you know, you, you know, you're a strong, really strong, one of the strongest independent promoters in London. And then you, so you, for people who aren't aware, you've then taken a step where you, you can perhaps correct this, but you've, you've partnered with Alex Murray and One Inch Badge, who is a similar size kind of independent promoter based in Brighton, but works through, you know, uh, does some national shows, but, you know, works through all kinds of levels up to decent size capacities. And then you two have joined together and joined with Kilimanjaro and a new entity called Form. So you're sort of getting into bed with, well, again, that's sort of, but you're, you, so that's, a, you've got, there's quite two, quite a lot of changes going there. Firstly, like partnering with Alex and then going into it. So, um, I'm interested for that. Like, sure. what kind of things were you made you think? Yeah, this is what I want to do. And what's it been? Well, let's just say that. What made you think this is kind oh, of what stopped. I want to do? This is kind of what I want to change. Uh, that's a good summary. I think of what you basically explain. Uh, you know uh, how it that worked. I mean, essentially, I guess a couple of short bits in between is that obviously we'd grown artists and started doing that really well. We, we'd created a couple of festivals. The festival called By the Sea in Margate. We Co co work on a festival called Visions and a few other things like that. I booked a festival called Blissfield. Um, Alex had done similar things as well, and we, we were very good friends. And obviously, non competing, as it were, him in Brighton, me in London, it's very similar, probably to what we talked about with Steve and myself in terms of we'd had similar trajectories, similar backgrounds in terms of working and in, in you know for, for off our own back and independently, but was kind of being you know music fans of different things. And we done we started to do a few things together. I guess the natural step for me was to then think. I'm doing stuff in London. Maybe I should do things outside of London a little bit more. Brighton, obviously, was a very natural sort of other market. So we were doing a lot of things collaborative together. We started doing a great escape party together. It was one of the first things we did just right. as friends, I think, was that. <clears throat> we also did a few, I guess, kind of interesting sort of tours together we, or, or shows together for sort of usually quite left field bands like Slint or Swans or things like that. A lot of because I think ATP had done them before and we were kind of getting given bits like that or some things like that. Who knows? Uh, we even did a quite strange, um, we got the rights, we went, to, we went to Konami, the video game producers in um, Oh yeah. In, in Windsor. I mean, we had a very strange meeting where we went and did a proposal and got the rights to this video game called Silent Hill, the composer to come over because he was keen uh, to basically do a sort of live video game event, which we did about 7,000 tickets across the country for. So that was, you know, we did stuff like this. It was kind of more just for fun because we just kind of had some similar interests. So anyway, without going on too long, we talked for a while about coming together and I think that and to, to work in a way that we could combine what we did in London Brighton and maybe do things where it made sense to sort of around the country um, and but very much keep our sort of how we've done it and the sort of independent ethos and as I mentioned before Steve and I had always talked a lot as well and I think that we could have just done it and come together but we start to think actually if we're going to do something slightly bigger um, maybe there's a kind of way to do this in our sort of alternative independent way where um, we can grow have a bit more infrastructure because we've both been doing just things off our own back. We had small teams individually, you know, it's, it's as ever, as one says, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an endurance sort of game sometimes year by year. Uh, and we were at that point where we felt like, I wouldn't say the glass ceiling approach, maybe where Steve was at in, in Stoke, but we definitely felt there was a point in our careers where we kind of wanted to change things up, think about things a bit more differently. And we've been having these conversations at similar points of our career, I suppose. And um, yeah, I just we, we spoke to some people about maybe coming on board and helping us do what we wanted to do, and immediately with you know with Steve and and, and Stuart, but you know, but primarily we just had a conversation with Steve and it very easy. So we just it, it made sense basically to kind of find a way to just I guess create something a little bit different than has existed in a promoting way before, a kind of more of a a kind of collaborative approach, which we've mm -hmm. done in a lot of ways, and. It, it just came about quite naturally, to be honest, from there. So 
yes, you explained it, it kind of seemed a bit different in a way, but it, again, it's just been, I guess, a, a more like an evolution of what we've done up to this point. Because it is really, it is different because normally, I guess, like perhaps, I'm, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but normally the route would be, uh, well, like Steve's journey, like the promoter goes, the promoter leaves the area and goes into a bigger company or yep. the company's bought out and owned by the bigger entity, you know, but this is, um, this isn't, this is a really interesting dynamic. It's there's the individual creativity because Alex Murray and One Inch Badge, um, you know, Alex is a brilliant promoter and has, exactly. yeah. yeah, you know, like really creative in terms of like thinking about not just about music, but other things like the Kamani things got into, you know, and he, he'll, he's, He's got a you know very creative brain like that, and he's very very strong independent promoter. Um, but you've managed to keep those identities whilst also then taking that step with a much much larger company. I think so. I think it is really yeah. interesting model that doesn't really. I can't think of other examples where that's happened. Well, that was it. I think some people, as you say, kind of just go start working a little bit with Live Nation or something like that, or have a thing like that, but and they don't really talk about it in those sort of ways. But we we wanted to make a, a feature of this, and that was the conversation with Steve, as we wanted to talk about. Uh, how we can actually offer something artists something a bit better maybe a little bit where there's there's different ways to sort of push things through a sort of you know a network where it makes sense or otherwise but, but keeping very much what we done up to this point is the sort of the main the main focus so so yeah that's that's the difference I suppose and um, and you know it happened just before we, we, we got it all going just well that's what I was going to ask how it was going but of course actually you you and you made the announcement I mean because both you and Alex were founder members of AIP and you came to us and sort of said hey we're going to do this thing um because obviously for us as an organization that looks after independent promoters is that is that is you know what's the shift from independent to, to not independent but which you're not you know you, you remain independent but then COVID came so it's very hard to perhaps go uh we can't really examine how it's been because you never really managed to go right. Um, and, and COVID is something we're going to sort of like, we're going to kind of ignore a bit, but I guess there has already been some change in terms of your, the way that you work and think and perhaps uh, being part of with Steve and with Stuart and the team. Um, actually, has that been quite nice to have some other people in the same boat and around you at this put terrible time it sounds bonkers but it's been the in a weird way it's been very fortuitous timing for a lot of reasons but i think we would have you know just getting our back end sort of structures together which we probably wouldn't have done if we just kept on running a million miles away thinking more about stuff about our future you know, we, we've been doing this a long time we're going to continue to do so it's more about um actually kind of working some of the ideas we had and the reason why we did this form structure and the kind of our plans for the future we've used this as a time to do that i mean it's not ideal let's not lie i mean i'd be i'd be crazy to pretend it was <laughs> for any promoter right now but um yeah there's the benefit has been yeah i mean I, I chat to steve pretty regularly about all kinds of things because we're not at gigs and i chat to alex about you know, things we all do those things a lot of our creative plans if you like for the future have actually had time to really flesh out a bit more so Yes, I'd say that's been, you know, and, and I think also we can all talk about, I guess, the fact that promoters generally have spoken to each other a lot more through this. It's been a lot more rethinking about what the future looks like and what could be better and what could be, you know, this is a challenging time for this industry, much like I've, I've talked about this before. Uh, other industries like the recording industry had their own difficult moments and came through it in a different way. I'm hopeful that's the case here. And I think that having this time and doing the changes we've made, I'd like to feel hopefully we're quite well equipped for it. So that, that re, yeah, the return to live, you know, which is it's we, uh, you know, particularly oh, prescient there, because an hour, an hour in we got there to the return to live. Well, yeah, <laughs> but it's all of those things that you're talking about, yeah, yeah, are you know, they're all they're all interesting for the audience that are out there. You know, th these are things that they are going through or have been through or want to go through or or not, and that so it, it's all very helpful. And but the return to live is very prescient by accident because there's some dates in the diary, um, but. In terms of that that thinking, you know, Dan, you just sort of mentioned this. You feel like the recorded industry has been through a whole change from CDs to Spotify or streaming, and and you have a belief that the, the return to live, we're going to see some changes, or you're, or you'd like to see some changes. Is that how you're thinking? In terms of, do you think the sector is going to the live sector is going to change? The audiences are going to change, and what kind of things do you think might happen, whether they're general or specific? Yeah, I think that when I became a promoter uh, it was a, it was the sort of lowest possible moment for the recorded industry and it you know felt like it was you know and, and that it was interesting in that way because they, it was really 
a very odd time to be like an A&R or things like that. It didn't make it unattractive for people necessarily, but it was noticeable that it was a sort of doldrum years, if you like, for a lot of that, that period, which gave way to a lot of boom and live, obviously. I do think that um, there will be some shifts. I think whether we, I'd love to it to continue in the way it did before, because there's so much great about it, but there's obviously a few things that will change, obviously, whether that's just straightforwardly in the, the growth, the speedy growth of virtual stuff in the, in the you know, which might have taken 10 years has taken one. Um, and people's people's kind of yeah approach to live. I think that in it's on one side hand, I think it's it's shown how important music is to people and how much people value it, and that's going to be great for us in a lot of respects because I think it's really important and people you know we're on the news a lot <laughs> about how much people miss it. And um, flip of it though is that yeah we the sort of in between thing about some people being confident being in gather space. We're going to see we're going to see how that is, and I think that um, I, I do think there is an opportunity for some interesting developments that people you know can embrace the part as part of it and i think that's what's going to be that's what's going to be in the coming in the coming months yeah it's interesting you're just running a poll and uh, how confident is everyone in the return of live in 2021 and actually uh, a quarter are very confident a quarter are very worried and about half are sitting in the middle so that's but that's and that's very interesting and steve um <clears throat> how are you feeling about the return to life, both from uh, the the industry side, like how is that? How are you feeling that's going to look and feel? Are there going to be changes or not? Will everything go? You know, will there be more cohesion and clever thinking? And and, and in terms of audiences, um, and I want to come on to you. Some of you, you know, talk about Ed Sheeran in a, in a little in a little minute. But yeah, how are you feeling about that audience demand too, and what might change for the better or worse? Well. <clears throat> um... I think, I think if you look at the ticket sales this week off the back of the announcement, uh, it's a very strong message from the public that they are ready and willing to come to shows this summer. So the challenge is going to be, can we sort out the insurance issue still and get a government-backed cancellation insurance scheme that, that means that the likes of Reading and Leeds can go ahead, uh, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> in terms of COVID, in terms of, of COVID measures, for gigs. Obviously, there's going to be test events, we think, in the spring. So I don't want to comment on that too much because I don't actually know what, what will actually be necessary. We won't know what's necessary until they've done the test events. And if the vaccine rollout is uh, you know, continues at the pace it's already at, then if everyone's vaccinated, you know, apart from basic COVID measures like, you know, like lots of hand sanitization stations and and good air exchange in venues, etc. What more will we actually need if the if the population's um, been vaccinated and COVID retreats to a degree? So uh, that's that's a that's a comment in terms of COVID things. In terms of COVID's effect on the industry, though, I will actually come out with some things I believe will be really positive. So, for example, digital ticketing that's going to become the norm, and that means it's going to make the touts jobs a hell of a lot harder. Because if your phone is on your mobile phone, it's linked to your number and to your actual phone, and you can't transfer it, um, and you, so your party has to arrive together. If you've got four tickets in your mobile phone, you arrive as four people, and your phone gets scanned four times, and then you go. It's really difficult to tout those tickets. So I think digital ticketing will be really positive. Mm -hmm. Like Dan said, one, the acceleration of streaming um, as a sort of as a, as a tool that artists use. Uh, now I'm, you know, I'm not actually call me old fashioned, but I'd rather stand in a room, watch a gig than watch it on the telly. Um, it's just a personal opinion, but I just, I think that the, the volume and the, and the atmosphere of being in a communal place with loads of people enjoying a moment and a big song is irreplaceable, but I think streaming does have a place. Um, so if a new artist wants to do, a tiny show somewhere like a, a really lovely church in London and do their new album in full and, and have a select bunch of people who manage to get tickets for it, but also stream it, crack on, really good. Um, so I think, I think streaming is going to be a positive thing. It's going to become part of the arsenal of tools that artists use to, to promote themselves and, and provide content online, etc. cetera. Um, and I think, yeah, I think we'll probably will see a general impact improvement in venues in terms of like sanitation and facilities you know be no longer acceptable to have disgusted toilets somewhere or or not a proper air exchange system 
um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, I think there will be some positives to come off the back of it. Um, I think the de- as, as for whether we get open again this year on June 21, I'm going to let the data, um, the, the data will tell us whether we can or not in due course. I was also thinking about some, because um, some of the questions coming in are about relationships with agents or other people, but also just thinking about, like, we're very grateful you've given up your time. You know, you, you both of you guys have given up time today. And I was thinking about when I was a promoter, my trips to London to meet agents, you know, that's valuable time they would take out to sit and have a coffee with you. But sometimes you'd go in and they'd have a headset on and they would just sort of turn around and give you, but actually Zoom, an agent could give up an hour on Zoom to 50 local promoters, right? And do, and yeah. uh, so there will be some, that, well, maybe we just created the idea, but some incredible ways that people could connect and communicate, um, which would be beneficial for all um, and for the ecosystem as a whole. So there might be things like that that will be, that will be really good and accelerate more opportunities, you know, without getting on the train and uh, going all the way down. I want to talk about, I just want to, before we hit some questions, I want to just ask one thing about, another thing about audience confidence, but I want to I mean, possibly use Ed Sheeran as an example, because Steve, that's, you know, your biggest client, but the, the, in terms of audience confidence and as a role as a promoter, Dan, the moment that you do that, the first time you get to do a second show, because that's a really interesting moment, right? Super exciting when it happens, but it's it's littered with peril too, right? Because, right? So who who in the chain, and Ed, you don't have to use Ed as an example, but but Ed's obviously somebody that smashed records with those, sec- but you don't know you're going to smash the records, right? And there's there's Stuart, there's the manager, there's the agent, there's the promoter, there's all the, who, how does all of that work? And how does that feel? Or maybe go back to a tiny small show that you did where you rolled over for the second time um but you know that's a it's a big thing because it can make or break a career right from Ed, from ed's perspective it could make or break a career um and it's made the career in some ways is that a hard thing to manage for everybody do you mean rolling over as in second night yeah like yeah you put one on sale but then you know you maybe have you got yeah where are you at how does it feel um, well I, w- I won't use that as an example i'll use i'll use an, I'll, I'll use i actually won't even use name a specific act I'll, I will think what people have to remember is, is that the media are obsessed with reflecting what the public want. So, so sometimes, specific, specifically in London and the major cities, the choice of venue is being used to try and drive the press and the radio. Yep. So they're overreaching. So let's say you've done a Manchester show before and you did 200 tickets. We might hold the Gorilla next, which is 500 tickets. But we only sold 200 last time, and that was only three months ago. So, you know, someone could say, well, hang on, how do you, how do you know you're going to do 500 just because you did 200? And that, that, those 200 people have already seen the act. So someone's got to take that leap of faith, and that's where we come in as the promoter. And it doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter if it's Wes at Now Wave or Luca SGM up there or me taking a Manchester show or Dan. Um, it's like one of us is going to go, yeah, we, we see it. We can feel it. It's happening. So we'll put our money down on 500 tickets. But then the agent might go, you've heard the album. You know how good the songs are. Can we hold, um, we actually want to hold Academy 2 as well. And so you're giving yourself room to manoeuvre potentially. And then let's say in London, you've already sold out a Scala, which is 700. And let's say we just feel like it's really going to go off pop. So they'll say, right, hold Shepherd's Bush Empire, try and get two nights, get a Friday and a Saturday, and then and then we want an offer on one night, but we want to hold the second if it's there, and we all feel it will be there. And it's just a hunch. And so you stick an offer in on your Shepherd's Bush, and if I've only sold out the Scala, which is 700, I might only offer on 1,400 at Shepherd's Bush. Meanwhile, the media see a press release go out with Shepherd's Bush Empire. And so and so announced their biggest ever London show to date at Shepherd's Bush Empire. And then that night you hear Jack Saunders or Hugh Stevens or Annie Mark talking about, oh, and this band that we've played since they were li- this big have just announced Shepherd's Bush Empire. And you can feel they're they're actually loving telling the audience how they've been supporting this act since they first played them two years ago, and now they're at this level. Of course, I know that 
it's a gamble as to whether or not they're going to do more than 1,200 tickets, but that's not on the press release. The press release just says Shepherd's Bridge Empire, blah, blah, blah. Then it goes on sale, and we get to about 1,400, and we're like, and it's moving well, and we've done 1,400 in maybe 24 hours. So on the Monday morning, I say to the agent, I was about we take that Friday off sale, and we had the second. And it, yeah, and everyone agrees, the manager, the agent, even the artist, they'll all of that, yeah, we're going to go for it. We feel like this is really happening. So we announced the second at Shepherd's Bush Empire. A new press release goes out due to demand. Artists add second. And then, of course, now the artist and, the, and the, the, the record label people are all seeing two nights at Shepherd's Bush Empire. Oh, my God, that's 4,000 tickets. At the point at which we've announced it, we've probably only sold 1,400. But the perception is this is going off. And then that perception then um, bleeds around the whole industry that this act is happening. And we've taken the first night off sale, which is just a sneaky promoter trick. But we've still got 500 tickets to go on that one. But we're going to get the Saturday up to 1,500 as well. And then we'll do that. Production holds release due to demand. Now, are we manipulating the market a little bit? Yes. Is that unethical? I'd say not. No, it's, um, Joe, it's we'll true, decide. It's yeah, we'll point. decide what we Yeah. And, of course, we're helping elevate this artist because – then you might then hear um, Greg James talking about the artist on the breakfast show going on about, oh my God, the Snuts have sold out two Shepherds Bush Empires. They're really happening. It's brilliant. We first supported them last year on the radio. And now, you know, and then of course it becomes a self-fulfilling thing. And, and you know, there's every now and again, there's an artist that just goes bang and it just goes interstellar. And um, I did one act at Brixton that did three nights. The first night took two months to sell out. The second night then got added and it took about two weeks to sell out. And then the third night got added and it took an hour to sell out. And that's... So you're building momentum and... Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Show business. It's all educated guesses. Over to you, Dan. Well, that was... I think you've... you've we've shown it very well which is we can we can sort of leave it there in, in a way but in that was because it's things yeah as i said i think show business is what it is it's nothing unethical it's it's the smoke and mirrors is part of of you know we have to remember that we're the entertainment business and there is an element that yes we're dealing with artist creativity and doing those things forward but that's actually kind of the creative side of it sometimes is where you're saying how can we help as promoters drive the actual full campaign and i think a lot of the time over the last few years, and this is why COVID has been interesting in that way, not to bring it back to COVID, but live has driven a lot of campaigns for artists. I think that's what's been quite an interesting shift because people are trying to launch artists now without live. And it's quite challenging because, and that's why I think there are, to bring us back to our return to live, you know, people need that in there because ultimately that is those moments that drive things to happen. A lot of people have put music out that's obviously done well through COVID and through this period of inactive live, but ultimately people need a moment to drive things around to actually make people feel that. And I think that's that's always been the nice side of what we do. Um, and I'm just going to bring it back to you to a question from Nathan here. I, I saw earlier, do I still enjoy it? Do we still enjoy it? Yeah, because absolutely. And even through this period, uh, I've, it's realized maybe how much how, how much I enjoy it because ultimately you're, you're creatively going, wow, that's, that's missing right now. I want to, you know, someone like Arlo Parks that's just that's had a massive, you know, year so far. It's just a real shame that she hasn't had that moment live. You know, that would be what that's what would have been happening. And I think that, um, or, or even Celeste, I'm just thinking of you know recent big big records. So that's yeah for me. That's, I definitely do because I think we're, I'm I enjoy the new challenges that are presented. I think that's why we should embrace some of them that may come about because it's a clear gap without without this. And that's why we need to why people. I think so, you. Like, yeah, and I think that you've, uh, I mean, I think Steve's explanation of that process and Dan, your summary of it is, 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 is excellent because you're quite right. The point is this, there is loads of great music, loads of great new music, and there's all of the historical recorded music. So everybody's attention is everywhere. I've just got a puppy, so I'm always in puppy mode. And every, everything's everywhere. And you're, what Steve's articulated is somebody might have had that link sent to them or they might have heard of the artist but they haven't listened to it yet and what what you're doing through this process the two of you is grabbing their attention back to it repeatedly and they'll listen and if the music's good then they'll buy the ticket right and because you, you can't like you said it's not unethical because you can't force anyone to go to the gig or like music they don't like they'll no. go because there's something in it so your job and and yeah you're quite right Dan that's without that 
those artists are missing a vital tool let alone, you know, the, the rocking up and having the festival slot and playing to a crowd. And you're both DJs. One thing, I used to be a, DJ, a failed DJ too, and I don't know if you used to do this, but if I had a new song that I really liked that nobody would hear, I would play big songs to get them on the dance floor, sneak the new song in, and hope they'd hang around, then play another big song. And it's kind yeah. of that, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, you love the the artist. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you love the artist and you want them to hear, yeah. So you trick That's them into like... Yeah. It's curation as well. It's, 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 you know, that's the skill of it in a way. That's why festivals are quite good as well, because you can often, or like, you know, for us, it was all about having that, uh, you know, that good flyer and that good mail list, because ultimately we can launch an artist often because they just they sneak it in almost, you know, it's like, here's a, here's a new Father John Misty show. Here's a new, um, you know, Elder Island show. Oh, here's, you know, um, Songhoi Blues, which I remember, I remember we did Songhoi Blues and it was a, I, it was a real small show. I think it was a server jazz, got a hundred people. And a few people came up to me and said, Oh, we just check this out on your mailing list. Mailer, it looked really interesting. <laughs> and, you know, and that's really nice to hear as a promoter because you see, you think, well, we really have actually introduced this incredible band to people. And then, you know, it goes on and obviously does the roundhouse. So it's, it's interesting that you can have these, these things there. You can sneak it through sometimes, you know. And I think then the secret's go, in the job title. <laughs> uh, we're called promoters for a reason. We are yeah. here to promote, like not just sell the tickets, make the sandwiches, book the venue and pay the bills. If you're a good promoter, you are promoting the talent. You're making them bigger. Like, and, and I always say, I still say this to this day, when, I, when an agent says, do you want to pick up load of cities on this artist? I'll say, you know what? You should go local to start with. Now, I know that phrase to start with is controversial because a lot of people will be like, well, hang on, why should I do it and then lose it? Um, but I'll flip that. If you had an act that sold out, if Stoke had an arena, and it sold out the sugar mill straight away. And then the next gig was going to go straight to arena. You know, would Danny go, yeah, we're in. Or would they get the calculator out and look at the costs and the ticket price and the capacity and go, oh my God, I could lose my house. Do you know what I mean? So like national promoters do exist for one of the reasons that like the, the level of risk at that level is hundreds of thousands of pounds or more. And, I know, I know that you never do, rarely, maybe in the case of an Ed, it would go from the Sugar Mill to Arena, but most people go on more of a journey where it's building blocks. Um, but the, once you get beyond the 1,000 tickets and the ticket prices are going up, you're talking about vast sums of money and agents and managers are concerned about whether or not they're going to get paid. And then the production people on the road are concerned about whether or not they're going to get dealt with properly, uh, whether, whether the show's going to be insured, whether there's going to be public liability, whether the rep is going to know what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. So I, th I do think that there's got to be some realism about the levels that individuals can get to. But starting at the bottom, I always say you should always go local. A local promoter will 100 times out of 100 do a way better job in their town than the national promoter. I think I'm, I'm going to say just quickly, because I think I see a couple of questions in here as well about you know, how important is it to be a local promoter, how important is independent, independent promoter making the step towards other promoters. And I think the only thing I would, I won't say I tweak Steve to your point, <laughs> but I'd just say that I would give um, an element to it is that obviously for some promoters who are doing that, they, they do want to take journeys with those artists and they do want to remain involved and they do, and you know, and obviously think about how they can become bigger promoters, which is great. And I think yeah. that my only, I guess, having obviously we've, we've both done that in different ways and we still have challenge from people who are challenging us as it were you know we've got ways to go um it's the thing there is a, it's a process of kind of a little bit of proving yourself ultimately and that's the truth i think you will win some battles and lose some and i think that we can't say that you won't and i think that ultimately as you it's it's it, well, there's a sort of it, the, the, the sort of the, the time things can take and be you have to be very patient i think it's promoted ultimately a lot of things like I said, artists that I've worked with for 10 years now are only at a point. And that, you know, I, I would have hoped a lot of them would be much quicker. But ultimately, the, there's, a, there's a kind of element of maybe getting a few artists to 500 cap first. Then, oh, hold on, a few to 800, then a few to 1,200. And then suddenly, you're not losing your house necessarily because maybe you've built things up slowly and, you know, rather than those things. And actually, agents can talk to you because they've worked with you and shown you a little bit down. I think that it's, you're not going to go from A to, to 0 to 100 straight away. There's probably, but there is a way to get there. It's just it's kind of maybe it maybe takes some 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 kind of some time. Yeah, I think is what spot say. on, spot on. I would I wouldn't disagree with any of that. And one thing I've tried to do over the years is if I've got really good relations with the local promoters like Craig and Steve in Liverpool, 
is I'll try and co-pro with them. And I'll, and if I say I'm going to keep them in, if I have the power to keep them involved, then I will stick to my word. Um, I don't see why. It's a very, once it gets that level, the pot's a lot bigger, there's a lot to go around, and you don't have to be a monopoly, kill all the competition, crush all, crush all people who stand in your way type vibes. Um, there's well, room think, for everyone. Yeah, and I think, I mean, overall, like, you know, yeah, there are some companies that take that approach of crushing and it makes no sense because as you've both demonstrated, you've arrived into the bigger companies because you've been allowed to breathe. It's like, you know, you, you the best promoters don't arrive fresh from college. They arrive, like you both just articulated, going through those processes, winning some battles, losing some. So it makes sense for the ecology as a whole to give those people space to have have some journey and have some battle and and. I think Steve said peaks and troughs, try and flat it as much as possible. We're running out of time because it's been brilliant. Um, I want to ask, like, tr as you try and look ahead right now, are there any, there's one question that's kind of come in, I think is very pertinent. Um, everything keeps moving and changing. What kind of things are you doing or not doing in terms of how you're booking your shows or announcing your shows? Or are you just, you know, selling your tickets? Are you just going, hey, there's been an announcement, let's release some more tickets? Are you changing the way that you do things uh, in terms of the marketing? How, you know, how, how are you responding to the constant change of news in terms of trying to get your shows on sale? Forget about whether they're going to happen or not. Yeah, I'm mean, happy to go just quickly, I guess. I think uh, to, to exactly what you sort of say is sort of being very, it's exhausting, but being very reactive really to, to reading the public mood in a way, because ultimately that is important in terms of, marketing into nothingness or when there's not those things is, is, isn't the right thing to do. I think that trying to be, you know, cautious in that way where it makes sense, I think, but also, you know, to remain optimistic and positive because as to Steve's point earlier, I mean, people are buying tickets. So like, look, we're very few refunds. People are very, very keen to be at events again. The, the, you know, people are talking with their, their feet or their clickers, whatever you want to call <laughs> it's, uh, it's noticeable so it's kind of giving people in a nice way what they want and obviously giving everyone something to look forward to uh and and but doing that at, at the sort of moments where it feels that that's the right time people want to have that conversation as it were and not kind of you know this feels unrealistic you're just putting you're not reading the mood you're basically saying come to this tomorrow when it's clearly not going to be the case and try not to damage you know artist campaigns and things by just this constant moving is in, doing it in a way that feels like because you know people want to go there and they want to be at that rather than um, rather than just kind of pushing along because it's difficult because we all, we all want to keep those things going and everyone everyone wants to be at those shows. So that's, yeah, re trying to read the mood and react, I think is probably the best thing I can say. Yeah. So our strategy. <laughs> Steve? <laughs> is that how you're feeling, Steve? I think you've got to be, um, try and find some balance between hope and optimism and negativity. And, and but sometimes that negativity is realism. Um, <clears throat> so Stuart Galbraith was quoted as saying the smart money is on April 22 and he got a load of grief for it, including off me, by the way. So, um, but if it's all about context, if you're talking about outdoor stadium level arena level shows, then the smart money would be on April 22 because like the risk at that level, if you've got like 20 arenas with simply red, the risk is phenomenal, not just to the promoter, but to the artist. Mm. So go as far into the future as makes sense um, for it to actually have a chance of happening at hundred percent capacity with no COVID around. So, um, but equally I, I, I was the one in the office going, if, if there was a conversation in the office about no shows before this date, I'd be like, how the hell am I going to ring up the manager of this brand new act? that has got one track out. that's trying to plan a career. that's just signed to a major label. We're trying to build a campaign. I can't ring their agent and say, we aren't prepared to do a show before this date. We're not prepared to even put it in the diary and put it on sale. Because I tell you what, that agent will go, we're going to go and speak to another promoter. Because even if the real the reality of the facts are, it's very unlikely to happen in that period. We told an actor I work with not to put their tour on sale for March this year, halfway through last year. We said, we don't think it'll happen. But they're like, we've got an album coming out. And so I was like, okay, well, as long as you know that there's a chance that March next year won't happen, and as long as you're prepared to put up the fact it's probably going to get rescheduled, and by the time you did a rescheduling, the avails 
for the autumn are going to be fucked. Excuse my French. Um, as long as you understand those rules and, and those those conditions around it, then we'll crack on and don't mm-hmm. say I didn't know yet. Um, and so I, I guess it's about finding that balance. That's what I've been trying to do all along. Yeah, because you, yeah, and that's very good. You want to manage expectations, and yeah, I think that's um, that's a lot of what we've done. So we're going to wrap up so we stay on time. Nobody, nobody wants a uh, nobody wants the fee of uh, the penalty of a late curfew. There's been some brilliant questions. Somebody in the chat wants to see if uh, one of you could mentor them. So I'll send you that link and maybe because you've both had some level of mentorship. And I think that's come through all of our chats, the support of other people. But what you guys have been saying today has been really supportive to those people out there. So thank you very much for sharing your time with us today. It's been fantastic. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining. We're going to announce... um, on International Women's Day, will be uh, Tom and Atom are going to announce another masterclass. Uh, so it will be announced on that day. Uh, it won't be happening that day, um, but that's um, going to be a fan- another uh, the fourth one in this in the series. A series that we're rolling it over, Steve and Dan. It's like a constant. The audience demand is so high. <laughs> um, so yes, that's yeah. there'll be a, there'll be another one. So um so that's it so thank you everyone for tuning in this will be available to watch again on atom's facebook page um so do check that out thank you to tom and atom uh, and then we'll just sit here quietly while tom switches everybody off goodbye <laughs>